My evilness, Boris, you really have got the place all decked out for Yule. <laughs> you even got the haunted uh, Christmas tree. Let's see if we can get him to... Well, yeah. Well, thank you, Haunted Christmas Tree. That was quite scary. <laughs> oh, and my dear, dear fiendish children, don't you worry. Uh, Santa hasn't completely lost his head. <laughs> and I can see where you might have made that mistake, you know, Krampus and all. He does get kind of wary uh, with that uh, bag of his and the, for naughty kids. And I'm, I'm pretty sure Santa wasn't naughty this year. <laughs> Well, anyway, Boris has got such a sense of humor this time of year, eh, Boris? Well, my dear fiends, happy Yule to you all, and uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Hanukkah, and Season's Greetings. I hope I haven't missed anything. Well, anyway, we hope that you're ready for a chilling, thrilling uh Yule Tide Tale. <laughs> you know, this time of year, there's a lot of Christmas specials on. You know, there's Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and there's Frosty the Snowman. Of course, there's always Ebenezer Scrooge, A Christmas Carol. You know, you've probably seen all the versions of them. Hmm? <laughs> I bet they haven't, hey, Boris? Good old Boris was rummaging in our vault here at Gargoyle Manor. Uh, for Monster Movie Night, when, well, he came across a very special film. It was a an old lost film of Rod Serling's. It was called, it is called, A Carol for Another Christmas. Oh, he took Charles Dickens' story, and my Dickens, did he ever twist it and turn it and made it into a Twilight feature. <laughs> so, my dear fiends, it's starring, uh, well, features, one of the features of the stars is Peter Sellers. Now, I know what you're thinking. Peter is well known for the Pink Panther and all those uh, comical bits that he's done. Well, this is a little bit different, eh, Boris? So, my dear fiends, let me turn right around here and put it into the old haunted keyboard. Carol for Another Christmas, Peter Sellers by Rod Serling. Excellent. Now, let's tune into the old haunted TV and we'll get it rolling, eh, my dear fiends? <laughs> Whoa. Oh, gotta tune it. There we are. <laughs> Whoa. Did your mama tell you not to turn on the TV at night? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs>
Uncle Dan. Fred. I wonder if we could talk for a moment. Well, I was planning to get to bed early tonight. This won't take long. Coffee, I'll have Charles bring another cup. No, thanks. Well, now, nephew, which one of your many causes brings you out into the snowy night, huh? Some Eubangies with the yaws? Some perverted mass murderer who's seen the light and wishes to assume his rightful place in society? As an alternative to the electric chair? No, no, that was, uh, that was last year, wasn't it? Well, what is it this time, a uh, movement to donate the Mississippi River to the Sahara Desert? You can do better than that. Not on a full stomach, I can't. Not before coffee. I'm here about one of your causes. What about Jack Harris? Harris? Jack Harris? I, uh, I don't know the fellow. Professor John Harris? You know him. Look, Fred, we usually wind up our little discussions yelling at each other. Now, let's get a quiet start this time, all right? Jack just called me. The University Board of Trustees canceled his credentials for the cultural exchange program. Oh, yes, yes, that Harris. Yes, I, uh, I heard that decision. It was your decision. You just said it was the trustees. I'm not even on the board. The words were theirs, but the voice belonged to a high-powered ventriloquist named Daniel Grudge. You sit here at that desk, throw your voice through a telephone, everybody jumps. Bankers, politicians, newspapers, universities. Coffee is cold. Now, why should a little thing like this sit so heavily in your tender tummy, Brad? Little thing? Uncle Dan, you know what this project has meant to all of us on the faculty, to the whole university. Everything from the raising of our own pedagogical standards to international recognition to... We've worked on it for an entire year. It's been cleared by Washington, cleared by the other end, and now you come along to dump it all. Why? Why should you object if one of our professors spends a year studying and teaching abroad? Yes, abroad. Poland, wasn't it? Your Professor Harris was to spend a year in uh, Poland at the University of uh, Krakow, was it not? Stop asking me questions you know the answer to. You care for a drink? No, thanks. And in exchange for our Professor Harris, the University of Krakow in Poland would send to uh, our university one of their boys, whose name, even if I knew what it was, is probably unpronounceable. Korzeniowski, it's really quite easily pronounced. And that's what's known these days as a cultural exchange. You know, Fred, for a fairly talented professor of history, you seem to be a little naive as to the current political climate of the native country of this professor, whatever his name is. Are you serious? Stop asking me questions. You know the answers to, nephew. Do you know what he teaches? Do you know what Korzeniowski and Harris both teach? 18th century European literature. What's that got to do with politics? I don't know. And I'm not interested in finding out. Get smart, boy. We've been digging his kind out of the woodwork for years. 
You don't really expect me to be a party to inviting one of them in here now, do you? Ah, <laughs> no. No, he stays on his side of the fence and Harris stays on ours. Get used to the idea. When you finally go, that'll be your epitaph, won't it? Here lies Daniel Grudge on his side of the fence. Well, get used to this idea, Uncle. There are certain fences the world can no longer afford. Quite a wall through Berlin, I've heard tell. Exactly. A fence. And who put it there? You think it's right? All right, Fred. Turn it off. Right now. There's only one side I'm on. First, last, and always. Our side. Don't you ever forget that. And spread it around. I want all the members of your various domestic and international orders of the Bleeding Heart to know precisely where Daniel Grudge stands. Because any time you and or one of your fuzzy fellow do-gooders tries to get me or friends of mine or my city, state or my country involved in any of your so-called causes, then I intend to be there every time with a body block that'll throw all of you flat on your involved butts. Now get out. Merry Christmas, by the way. Yes, yeah, so it is. And tonight, especially tonight, I am in no mood for the brotherhood of man. You mind? I've heard that speech. And heard it. Oh, I've had it with you, Fred. With all of you, I've had it. Right up to here. Mind your own business. And let everybody else mind theirs. Your responsibility happens to be your classroom. Not classrooms in Krakow, Poland, Butte, Montana, or Johannesburg, South Africa. Do you insist upon making it a better world? Won't you die happy until you do? Do you insist upon helping the needy and oppressed? Is that some kind of an itch that you can't stop scratching? Then tell them to help themselves. Let them know the cash drawer is closed and make them believe it. You'll be surprised how much less needy and oppressed than needy and oppressed turn out to be. But you've heard that one before. And heard it. Now, I can't change you, and you can't change me. So just stay out of my way, Fred. Out of my house, and out of my life. Uncle Dan. Uncle Dan, this is Christmas Eve. A very special night, apart from everything else. For you and for me. All my life, we've disagreed about most things, you and I. But there's one thing we both had in common. Someone we cared the world about. Your son, my cousin Marley. May I have that drink now? Every thing on this earth that I cared anything at all for. And to what end? So that his life could be snuffed out, his fine young body turned into a bundle of bleeding garbage, in return for which I'm sent his dog tags, some medals, and a 12 word telegram. Something for something. I give them a son. And they give me back his effects. And that, I submit to you, is a lousy bargain. Nobody could argue that. The point is, that kind of bargaining has got to stop. Oh. And who's going to stop it? Armies of professional plea coppers, like you? Your kind mouth the platitudes that get us into war? 
His kind go off to fight them. You might raise that point with one of your debating societies. The point that every two decades we seem to pay for your indiscriminate affections with the lives of our sons. Those indiscriminate affections, as you put it, is simply the acknowledgement that all men have sons. That grief for the unnecessary debt is not exclusive to this country, this town, or to the House of Grudge. Mine is exclusive. It concerns me. Forgive me, Uncle Dan. But I feel you mourn the death of Marley less than you mourn your personal loss of him. You keep his room like a shrine. You set a place for him at dinner each Christmas Eve because he died on Christmas Eve. Those things are for you, not for him. Who cares who they're for? I'm the one who feels the pain. And you'll go on feeling it, nursing it even, until you realize the true tragedy, the tragic insanity of Marley's death. Not that your son was killed by another man's son, but that mankind still allows such dying to happen. It wasn't his war. No war is anybody's war. I'm not talking about anybody. How do we stay out? By getting ourselves involved with the same people, the same problems, the same places? None of them are business? Is that your answer? Involvement? A hophead's pipe dream in which everybody, yellow, black, and white, gets thrown into one pot? And now comes a stew called World Brotherhood, in which mankind lives forever in, in peace and putrefaction. Is that your answer? Oh, not even close. That's the way you keep putting it. Maybe for some very private reason you have to keep telling it to yourself that way. At any rate, as you said, I sure couldn't change you. Thanks for the drink. And I have a Christmas present for you, Fred. Call it a contribution, if you like, to all your causes, involvements, exchanges, cultural and otherwise, whatever terms you apply to international freeloading on our pocketbook. If you have this overpowering concern for everybody everywhere in the world, here's your answer. Just you put your efforts, sweat, and faith into developing the fastest bombers and the most powerful missiles on Earth. They'll provide a lot more security for our young and for the rest of the world's young than all your debating societies, forums, treaties, pacts, and other forms of surrender and handout. Excuse me. That's quite an answer, Uncle Dan, for today. But what about tomorrow? Of course, you'll grant all other nations an equal right to put their faith and sweat and effort in trying to make their bombs faster and more powerful than ours. Just let them try it. Each behind its own fence. Each capable eventually of destroying everything and everybody else. And each uninvolved with the other. Uninvolved with us? I'll settle for that. Just let them know we have the biggest and the fastest. Just let them know we're not too chicken to use them. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. To all men, by the way. You, did you hear anything? Like what? Are you all right, sir?
Well, my dear fiends, are you enjoying tonight's feature? <laughs> A Yuletide classic, if ever it was. In fact, it's Rod Serling's lost episode because he was trying to make a whole new series, you know, like his Twilight Zone. Well, this one was going to be uh, with basically taking uh, classic stories like, well, A Christmas Carol and twisting them around. <laughs> well, my dear friends, as you can see, I'm here with Mr. Claus and Mr. Krampus. They're here uh, to, well, to bring in the Yuletide feelings. <laughs> it makes your chills go up your spine, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, when I was just a little nipper, good old Santa and Krampus, they used to bring me wonderful monster gifts. Uh, kind of like this one right here with uh, the shrunken head apple sculpture with um, Vincent Price on the very front of the cover. Yeah, these were very fun little games of sorts. You just take an apple and you would uh, carve it out and you'd put it in the oven and it would shrink it and make it look like a shriveled shrunken head and then there was hair that came with it and you could well you know you could could make it look even more like a shrunken head of course we also got the Ouija board now this is a very old one here this is not the Parker Brothers but this is before Parker Brothers it's the William Fold um, Mystifying Oracle, a wonderful talking board, the Ouija, or the Wee Ouija. And this is what one of the very first ones looked like, the cover of it. And inside there is the, the board and the planchette that came with it. Of course, I have it nicely wrapped, it would seem, so that, uh, well, it keeps it better that way for uh, having it on display. Good old Santa Claus and Krampus here. They've brought me wonderful gifts over the years. It has helped me fill up my wonderful museum here at Gargoyle Manor uh, with monsters and masks and games and movies and just all sorts of wonderful things. And I hope that uh, Santa and Krampus will be good to you this well, you know, with coal and presents. Because, <laughs> you know, there's got to be a little bit of a naughty, a naughty and nice, a sort of a balanced mixture to go around, eh? Well, my dear fiends, happy Yule, and let's get back to tonight's feature, A Carol for Another Christmas. What do you say, Chief? Your grudge, huh? Daniel grudge, right? Where? Uh, what is this? Some kind of a uh, troop transport? <laughs> yeah, you might call it that. On its way. From France? One of our stops. Or where else? You name it. Meet the troops. They're dead. Killed in action. Chateau Thierry, Bellow Wood, Le Mans. How are you going to keep them down on a farm after they've seen Paris? They saw Paris very briefly. Lafayette, they were there. Now you talk like the AEF. What's your name? I'm all the AEFs. Also BEFs. The Poilus, the Huns, the Ruskies, etc. Gallipoli, the Crimea, even Waterloo, if you care to go back that far. You get the picture, Chief? I'm all of them. I'm the one who rallied around the flag. Any flag. All flags. See what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, no names and all names, huh? <laughs> you know, I haven't heard that one since the radio programs in the 30s. 
Your name is uh, Joe, Tony, Izzy, Pat. All one and the same. America the melting pot, right? Wrong. I'm not getting across to you, I can see that. Who said only America's poet? I'm the dead, all the dead. We're quite a stew, you'll have to admit. Still, nameless as I am, I've got a terrific title. The Ghost of Christmas Past. Has that hit you? It doesn't. No, I don't look like a ghost, huh? You want to make your point? It's damp out here and I'm uncomfortable. Uncomfortable? You, Chief? Well, I've been given to understand you were an old salt. That was 20 years ago, when I was in the Navy. I'm afraid you still don't come for any move. Not 20 years ago. 20 years from now. This is 1918, capiche? It was a long war for some of these boys. And short for some. And a short life for ours. Which ones were yours? Can you pick them out? Yeah, we didn't belong in that one either. <laughs> Made the world safer democracy, did they? That's what they were told. Yeah. They sure as hell gave it a try. Look, they change the hats, they update the slogans, but it's the same old shell game. Like clockwork. Every 20 years, somebody rings a fire bell 10,000 miles away, and out comes Uncle Sam's expeditionary sucker brigade. Is that what they are? Suckers? Is that what your son's gonna be? My son? My son? My son will be a victim, just as these men are our victims, of somebody else's war. <laughs> you kill me, Chief, you really do. If it isn't Valley Forge or the Boston Tea Party, you leave it strictly alone. Your big gripe is what? Because every 20 years, American boys got to climb on troop ships and head off to someplace else? It rubs your raw. So what else is new? 60,000 limeys die in Flanders. 100,000 frogs catch it if we're done. The Germans march through Belgium, and Austria declares war on Japan. But who cares? It's a nice summer. Yeah, Boston's going to win the World Series. So we'll rock on the front porch and swat flies. Do I, uh... Translate you right, Chief? Better than American blood. Infinitely better than American Amen, blood. Amen, I grant you. If it were possible. But it ain't possible. War is also a contagious disease, Mr. G. And until we can stamp it out... Nobody... Nobody ever found a way to do that. Right. But is that any reason to stop trying? The one thing we do know... The only chance to keep this particular disease from spreading is to keep talking. So long as you talk, you don't fight. Simple. Look, I bump a guy in the street. He bumps me. We stand there, we argue. He gives me lip, I give him lip. But when we stop talking, we start swinging. And then we bleed. Then we got problems. Like winding up dead. I recognize the commercial. But it's no sale. <laughs> I'm not selling you, pal. I'm donating to you, free of charge. Remember the, uh, excuse the expression, League of Nations sport? That was going to be the point there, remember? I would have been opposed to the League of Nations. Of course you would. And you were. So you blew it. Bunch of fancy characters with top hats and monocles. We're not buying any of that, right, Mr. G? No sale. We've had it with foreigners. We've had it with, with making the world safe for democracy and the rest of the slogans. So we tell them to drift. We're sitting this one out. That's how you keep wars from happening, right, Grudge? Don't get involved, right? Well, is it? Tell them, they'd like to know. Wasn't that how you kept the world from a second world war? Uninvolvement, stay isolated? Wasn't that how? Well, tell them! Well, obviously, if we hadn't become involved, why, they wouldn't be here. No, they, they wouldn't be here. They'd be back in their hometowns. What was left of them. Buried right where they fell. And 
Another ship? Also on her way. I can just make out the deck. Those are American soldiers from my war. <laughs> Nicely put, Chief. They're the sons. These are the fathers. Yeah, after 1918, we got sick of war. Fed up. All those American kids getting blown to pieces, out of sight in foreign places with strange sounding names. So for the next 20 years, we closed our eyes and decided what we couldn't see wouldn't happen, right? Of course, we don't want to take all the credit, do we? I mean, we weren't the only ones playing shut-eye. When old Adolf walked into the Rhineland, France didn't want to get involved. Italy pulled down the window shade when Hitler took Austria. England wasn't about to involve herself when Czechoslovakia went under. And Russia kept the phone off the hook while Poland was destroyed. And before you knew it, everybody was singing, don't rock the boat, while it sank slowly to the bottom. So they died at other places, on other dates. Don't you tell me you're not selling anything. You listen to me. Nobody, nobody, mortal man or dressed up ghost, can convince me that every time there's a war, we have to step in and finish it. Now you listen to this. The next one, the next one, we don't bring up the bucket. We stay home. We stay on, on our, our side, side of the fence. <laughs> Talk about your old time radio shows. Seems to me I heard that one before, too. Hey, you want to know something, pal? That ocean you call a fence keeps nothing out anymore. Except fish. It's a lousy stream of water now. It's about as wide as a ditch. Well, a couple of supersonic bombers can spit over it. And I see a BM will leave it behind. You don't want to get involved. Sport, you got a job ahead of you. You really got a job. You got to disinvent the airplane, and the missile, and the submarine, and a little old thing called the bomb. It. See what I mean? You don't want to get involved, you got to give back the 20th century. If you can find a chump to take it. But isolation? I got news. They went out with gas, light, and 50 cent steaks. It's for the dinosaurs, isolation. And closing your eyes, that's for sleeping. Also, at certain times, it, it leads to dying. Convoy. Hundreds of ships, thousands of ships. Loaded with boxes, Chief. China, Ethiopia, Spain, Latvia, Hungary. Undeclared wars, police actions, some minor league insurrections. All the way back, Chief. All the way back as far as anyone can remember. And still farther. But it all boils down to somebody stopped talking. So they fought. So they bled. So they died. Hey, wouldn't you think, Sport, with all the brains we got on this earth, the way we build things and cure things and invent stuff on Tuesday that wasn't possible on Monday, wouldn't you think we could come up with something that could keep a kid from getting killed at the age of 18?
Prost. Sir? Where do they go? The ships, I mean. Where do they go? Nowhere. Like I said, just on their way. Why, Mr. Grudge, you, uh, you want to throw a wreath or something? We've reached your port, Mr. Grudge. This is where we get off. In here. What's in there? A place you should remember. A place, a, a foreign place you had a feeling about one time. I doubt it. Do you, Chief? Well, maybe you just don't remember too good. Not only where you've been, even what you say, like, let them know we're not too chicken to use that bomb. They already know that, Mr. Grudge. Remember any better grudge? Hiroshima, right? Hiroshima. I was here in September 1945. I was off my ship. I came here. Of course, this is only your memory of it. It wasn't quite as clean as you remember. Oh, well, they did quite a job. They cleared away all the dead real quick. They only left the Silence. You recognize the officer, Chief? Why, it's me. It's me 20 years ago. It's me when I came here that afternoon. The Daffy Tricks memory plays. Some things we think we forgot, we only misplaced. Would you like to get out here, sir? speak English? Yes, Commander, I do. Uh, Grudge is my name. My cruiser's in Yokohama. This is Lieutenant Gibson. She's attached to our headquarters there. Tell me, Doctor, who has that lovely voice? That is Sachiko. It means child of happiness. Sachiko? Doctor, was she... She was one of the group of schoolgirls. They're clearing away fire lanes when the bomb fell. Would you care to meet them? They're very lonely here. They enjoy company. Thank you. I must tell you that when the plane flew overhead, these children looked up at the sky. Their faces were upturned to the blast. They suffered what we call flash burns. It is a term we used to describe instantaneous thermal radiation. How badly were they burned? Have no more faces, Commander. I drove by. I'm going to touch what today is at the Kitenda. Told the young ladies that you're American naval officers and you've come to. Wish them well. Uh, 
Uh, doctor, I, I know it's not much consolation, but at least we can hope that their children will... Children, Commander? These girls? Uh, excuse me. Lieutenant? Sir. Never seen a burn case before? Several times, sir. I was at the Bethesda Naval Hospital. I was there after Coral Sea, after Midway, after Samar. I saw a lot of burn cases. And when you saw them, did you run? The burn cases I saw were American sailors, Commander. They had been fighting an enemy. They weren't school children. The distinction is most subtle, sir. I'll give you that. But by God, there is a difference. What about the kids at Pearl Harbor who looked up toward the sky? Or Malayan kids? Or Chinese kids? Sympathize all you want, Lieutenant, but keep your perspective. The President of the United States found it necessary to drop that bomb because there would have been 500,000 American casualties and a couple of million Japanese dead had he not dropped it. Harsh as it may sound, in my book, that makes simple arithmetic. Commander, I wouldn't debate military planning with you. I'm just suggesting that we are standing in the middle of what was once a city. For on one given morning, 100,000 people were killed. People, Commander. That's almost as many deaths as the Confederates had in four years of civil war. Quite apart from anything else, sir. Doesn't that suggest to you that from this second on, if the world ever decided to go to war again, it could kill itself off in a couple of afternoons? Doesn't it suggest, sir, that maybe, maybe war is obsolete now? Just. Just do me one favor, would you please, Commander? Don't call it arithmetic anymore. sisters. That's where they were that morning. Whenever there's thunder now, you always remember.
If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. Your enemy thanks you, Commander. Not in the rain, Mr. Grudge. I remember the rain. A yellow child is a black child, is a white child, is a child. Can we agree to that much? Where to now? Through there, Mr. Grudge. Oh, I've been there. <laughs> this time it's it's another place. Like Every place is another place. Are you coming with me? No, sir. I'm then. In there is now. Grudge, isn't it? Daniel Grudge. Join me in a snack, won't you? Potluck, I'm afraid. This table, my chandelier. You have an eye for possessions. Glad to see it. Little turkey, Mr. Grudge? Drumstick? Wing? Baked ham, perhaps? Candied yams? Suckling pig? I find myself overeating at Christmas. Thanksgiving, too, a tradition of overeating, as it were. You don't make sense to me. My apologies, Mr. Grudge, I thought you knew. I'm the ghost of Christmas present. Representing what? Gluttony? <laughs> if you like. No, I, I represent the human race, Mr. Grudge. So, to a certain extent, does gluttony. Also starvation, I represent that, too. You might say that I'm as close to being a walking, eating image of the human race as it's possible for a man or a phantom to be. Part of me feels a gnawing hunger. Part of me is satiated. I'm warm, contented, healthy. But much of me shivers in the cold. Now I understand. This is where I get my lecture about the haves and the have-nots. Mankind includes extremes, Mr. Grudge. Extremes. It's some people living alone in a 24-room house and 24 others living in one room. It's some eating high off the hog and some simply not eating at all. Not at all.
displaced persons. Today, more than 20 years after... Quite a few of them. Still around. The barbed wire set. How can you eat like this when you know that they're right there staring at you? Why not? Well, that takes a special breed to stuff himself in front of Star. You hit the point there, old boy. You really did. Well, it takes a special breed indeed. But you see, I don't happen to be a breed, Mr. Grudge. I'm a ghost. I don't have a heart. I don't have a soul. No nerve endings, no brain center. I'm just a reflection. But then I've already told you that. Shall I now tell you how many times you've stuffed yourself while two-thirds of the world starved in a cage? Yeah. Throw him a bone. Don't you talk to me like that. I have feelings. Nothing on this earth can force me to eat while starving people watch me. Watching makes all the difference, what? You never saw them while tearing into your mashed potatoes. They weren't actually there when you buttered your bread. There. Better, Mr. Grudge? Appetite back? Two. Sit down. You're gonna have to explain the logic of man to me, Mr. Grudge. For example, tell me how you come about your selective morality. This ease with which you strip off your conscience like an overcoat and let your satisfied belch drown out the hunger cries that fill the air around you. How do you create this exact science whereby you disinvolve yourself from all the anguish of the world that doesn't happen to be in your direct line of vision. Why, well, doesn't take a special breed of man at all, Mr. Grudge. That is man in his normal condition. No, no, man isn't cruel. I don't think I'm cruel. But we can't, at least, at least I can't, spend my time grieving because part of the world is rich and part of it is poor. Because part of it has and part of it has not. But we see, we actually see human beings in want. We react. We respond. <laughs> Is that a fact, Mr. Grudge? Do you insist upon making it a better world? Won't you die happy until you do? You insist upon helping the needy and oppressed? Then tell them to help themselves. Let them know the cash drawers closed and make them believe it. You'll be surprised how much less needy and oppressed the needy and oppressed turn out to be. I could need another bite. They make the portions much too big these days. Obsolete materials. Vitamins, calories, small fragments of nutrition. That's not what they want. You tell him, Mr. Grudge. You tell him what it is. It's bombers and missiles, isn't it? Tell him that's their diet for survival. No, no, no. That, uh, that was in a different context. I was talking politics at the time. Politics? Mr. Grudge, politics? Now grasp this, if you can. Humanity is no longer a political thesis. It is not a subject for debate. There are no pros and cons, no arguments and rebuttals. We are talking about human want and human need, and this is a fact of life. And as to your involvement, Mr. Grudge, you are involved, sir, as of the date of your birth. You are all mankind, because you are a part of mankind, a willy-nilly, as it were.
mankind, Mr. Crutch. In there, the hungry part of mankind, the anguished part, the dispossessed. If you shared a loaf of bread with them, how would you be relinquishing your freedom? Or if you joined other nations to administer vaccinations to their children, how would you have desecrated your flag? Or if you had offered them solace and hope and comfort, how would you have made yourself susceptible to tyranny? What are they singing? Foreign words, but not necessarily conspiracies to destroy you, Mr. Grudge. Just Christmas songs. And of those who do not celebrate Christmas, songs of hope. They sang them in their languages before you did in yours. Your Christmases have just been a lot merrier, that's all. And your hope more of a reality. Are there many like this? Many. Mr. Grudge, many. You'd like it statistically. Would you appreciate that? The clean, calculated order of mathematics. Like how many million tons of wheat are surplus? How many tons of butter rot in warehouses? Well, here it is, Mr. Grudge, arithmetic. The mathematics of now, right now, this Christmas. But don't take your eyes off these faces. Keep relating. On this earth, Mr. Grudge, there are 10 million displaced persons. They are without homes, without property. They own nothing. They are stripped of rights, stripped of nationality, barbed wire nomads whose crime was that they lived in a world that went to war. But don't take your eyes off of them. Keep relating, Mr. Grudge. On this earth, 13 million human beings have tuberculosis. There are 10 million blind. There are 130 million cases of malaria. Today, the present, now on the clock and now on the calendar. Two thirds of the world, Mr. Grudge, go to bed hungry. One half of the Earth's population, that's three billion people, actually suffer from hunger, from lack of food. Of these, Mr. Grudge, there are 100 million children. No more now. No more now. No more this moment. When, Mr. Grudge? Tomorrow, Thursday. A week from today, will you think about them? A month from the day, will you involve yourself? I, I don't want to see them. I don't want to look at them. Do. Do, Mr. Grudge, look at them now. Because tomorrow, a week from now, a lot of them won't be around. No more now. I want to get out. I want to go back where I belong. Do you understand? I just want to leave here. Please leave me alone. Grudge. I was expecting you. I thought you'd be here a bit sooner. This is the meeting hall in our town. That's what it is. This is our town hall. Why is it this way? You're in the future, Mr. Grudge. The future? The world's future. You've gone on a bit, so to speak. What do you think of the old neighborhood? 
Our town hall. But what could have done this? What happened here? Time. Time happened here, Mr. Grudge. Attrition, neglect, misuse, a few passing catastrophes. Time. Of little consequence, really. There grew to be less and less need for a meeting place, for a platform for debate. The American town hall, you will remember, Mr. Grudge, was a microcosm of all the meeting halls of the world. Places where men could talk it over. It seems we reached a moment in time when talk became superfluous. So now your town hall is past tense. But then again, if you step outside, you will note that most of what you see is past tense, or rather, most of what you don't see. How far in the future am I? It is a Christmas Eve, a night of December the 24th. The year is not important. Calendars are past tense now also. The clock is stopped. Indeed, the clock is stopped. So has electricity. The fact is, there are so few people around, the loss is hardly noticed. Why? Comprehending are you, Mr. Grudge? There was a war. A dandy. When? When? On doomsday. We don't have dates now, but that's how it's remembered. The exact hour hardly matters, does it? It seems. At a given moment, we thought that they'd drop some bombs, or they thought we'd drop some bombs. Anyway, somebody thought somebody had dropped some bombs. By then, of course, everybody had the bomb. They'd all been wanting it, you remember? It got so with no controls that nobody was really anybody if they didn't have the bomb. What you see before you, Mr. Grudge, is a tiny part of a big, round, radioactive mud burying. Is it all like this? Is the whole world a burying ground? All of it. All of the towns, in all of the meeting places, in all of the countries of the world, just like this. Did no one speak out? Was there no single voice of reason? But what about the, the United Nations? It was supposed to keep the peace. The United? Oh. <laughs> That town meeting hall. Oh, yes, well, that went some time back, I'm afraid. You see, they dropped out. Or maybe we dropped out. Anyway, somebody dropped out. And pretty soon everybody was dropping or had dropped out. And before anybody knew it, the talking had stopped. But there were voices, Mr. Grudge. The world didn't lack for sound. Behind each separate fence, each separate wall, came screams of anger, suspicion, and prejudice. And they grew, and they grew. But there were no answers, remember. No discussion. No place for it. And so, in the end, the world was filled with the noise of hate. And inevitably... Ah... Hey, my dear fiends, an interesting uh, visage of uh, reinterpretation of Charles Dickens' The Christmas Carol, eh? <laughs> I bet you haven't seen anything of, like this one before. <laughs> uh, Boris here has just has the beak for finding such wonderful gems like that in the vault of the, uh, of the museum, <laughs> don't you, Boris? He's such a oh, wonderful little fellow. In fact, this Christmas, I decided to give him something that he would in whoa wow <laughs> that haunted that <laughs> okay all right okay thank you sorry about that folks but anyway as i was saying i thought i would give boris a wonderful treat and present this year he loves these tidbits that uh, people lose around this time of year in the snow, you know. <laughs>
Well, here you go, Boris. Hope you enjoy it and many, many returns, as they say, eh? Okay, there you go. Oh, you do like it, don't you? All right, my dear fiends. Well, I hope you guys out there have gotten the presents that you wanted or were about to get or or special something like a nightmare or, you know, a Ghostbuster uh, game set or who knows, you know, maybe even, oh, a cut off foot just like Boris has. <laughs> well, my dear fiends, let's get back to tonight's feature, Carol for Another Christmas. The inheriting strong of the earth, the fittest who happen to survive, the leftovers of the crap game after they rolled the H-bomb and nobody made their point. government of the me people. Now, why don't we just relax and get nice and cozy? The first item on uh, today's agenda is this business. If the people from uh, down yonder and the people from Cross River wanted to come in here and talk about what they call our mutual problems, mm. our common differences. Mm. Now, they want to talk, 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 talk about our problems. They want to debate, debate, debate about solutions until somehow they get their problems solved. They want to waste our time. They want us to commit ourselves to that kind of surrender. Now then, they don't come out in so many words and say that they want to take us over. <laughs> They're too clever for that. But that's what they want. They want to take over us, individual me. And if we let them seep in here from down yonder and cross river, if we let these do-gooders, these bleeding hearts, 
propagate their insidious doctrine of involvement among us, then, my dear friend, my beloved me, we's in trouble. Deep, deep trouble. <laughs> Because, because we have now reached a pure state of civilization. The world of the ultimate me is finally within our grasp. It's a world where only the strong will exist, where only the powerful will love, where finally the word we will be stamped out and will become I forever. Because we are each the wise. We are each the strong. And we are each the individual me's. Me! a phantom as I am. speak. To the best of our knowledge, we are all of humanity who remain alive. All that's left. And we have survived the Holocaust. And if we are to go on surviving, we must work together now. We must talk together. <laughs> and if other people want to join us, if they want to talk with us, we, we must listen to them. <laughs> And we must respond to them. <laughs> we must begin again. We must have law again and ethics and honor and decency. <laughs> <laughs> the potential goodness of men. The potential morality of men. <laughs> the capability. That's it. The capability of human beings to achieve dignity and decency. Bring him over here, come. Bring him over here. You are charged with the treason of involvement. 
You are charged with the subversion of the individual me. How do you plead? to say it's your right as an individual me you know just say anything comes in your head you don't have to think about it just say it go ahead oh uh, you want to use the microphone I may be all the sanity that is left. I may be all the conscience that remains on earth. I can't let you kill me! Animals, miserable, rotten animals. Revelation, Mr. Grudge. Brand new experience for you, is it? Don't you remember people shouting, jump, jump, jump in your day, closing their windows to screams in the street, hiding behind their newspapers in the subways while their fellow men were being assaulted? And later, while civilization was being raped? Take a good look, Mr. Grudge. Jump! 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 friends, next on the agenda, we must go out and dispose of those people from down yonder on Cross River who want to come in here and talk. We must dispose of them, you understand? Dispose! Dispose! Because we are the individual me's, and we must carry our glorious philosophy through to its glorious culmination, so that the end with enterprise and determination, the world and everything in it will belong to one individual me, and that'll be the ultimate, the absolute ultimate. <laughs> yeah! 
So, Mies, after we kill the interlopers, the talkers, the involvers, who are on their way here now, we shall then be free to proceed with the most important business of all, which is the killing of each other until there remains only the one individual me. Right? Right! One? One! Alone! Alone! Then let's get at it. Each behind his own fence, each behind his own barricade. Follow me, my friends, my loved ones, to the perfect society. The civilization of I! <laughs> enough for you, is it, Mr. Grudge? Rubble and madness. Rubble and madness. I can't imagine why you're surprised. When the first bomb dropped on Hiroshima, the fate of man could have been predicted by a cut-rate gypsy. The ultimate garden of Eden. Planted by man, cultivated by his weapons, and irrigated by his blood, and brought to fruition by his prejudices and his hate. Ghost, Ghost, tell me something. Did I die before all this? to me. Just answer me one thing. One thing. Is the world that you show me tonight the world as it must be or as it might be? Tell me. I want to know. Tell me. Tell me. Must it be like this? Must it be like this? Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Are you all right, sir? I just went up to call you. Your bed hadn't been slept in. Oh, I, uh, I must have dozed off by the fire in the study. I, uh, I spent the night down here, Charles. Well, I'll see about your breakfast, sir.
Uncle Dan. Good morning. Are you all right? Well, yes, of course I am. Uh, why shouldn't I be? I didn't seem too good at 3 o'clock this morning. I what? When you phoned me. When I phoned you? Oh, yes, I, uh, I may well have done that. Come in. Please. You said on the phone that you wanted me to drop by on my way to church, that you had something to say to me. I, uh, well, I, I just wanted to, uh, to apologize to you, Fred, for, for last night. Thank you, Uncle Dan. I... New York, United Nations, children of the delegates singing Christmas carols in their native languages. Of course, that won't stop their fathers from beating each other's brains out tomorrow with words. I've heard those songs. Not here, somewhere else. Recently, too. I'll have Charles turn it off. Uh, no, no. It's a good sound kids' voices. <laughs> you know, Fred, I, uh, about this family of nations, I'm not at all sure that it's the final answer. Perhaps it's not the final one. So far, it's the only possible one. Possibility? Perhaps. So long as there are children, I suppose there are possibilities. So long as there are children, there have to be possibilities. I've been giving things some thought. Some, uh, some second thoughts. Oh? Any conclusions? No, maybe an observation or two. For instance? For instance, the old one, banal by now. That no man, as the poet says, is an island. Seems the conclusion is inevitable. There must be involvement. Every man's death does diminish me. It appears we've run out of the luxury of alternatives, Fred. We find ourselves living in a world in which we either greet the morning or accept the night. So I wish you a Merry Christmas, Fred. And a good morning. Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good morning, Mr. Grudge. I, uh, I thought I'd have my coffee in here this morning.
Wow, my dear fiends. Well, you have to give it to Rod Serling. He sure had the twists and the out and the and the ring arounds and get he finally got there in the end just like Charles Dickens you know <laughs> that fellow he finally decided to well you know to be a little bit better to his his friends and his workers and all that right Boris you know, loved ones and you know that's the that's the meaning of the season right there loved ones <laughs> you got to do all you can for them or to them or what have you or else watch your back one or the other. <laughs> Just like with Boris here. Well, my dear fiends, I hope that you have had a wonderful holiday and enjoy your presence and hope that you've enjoyed tonight's feature on Monster Movie Night. I, Bobby Gal Monster, your host, along with Boris T. Buzzard, wants to wish you a very, very scary, merry holiday. <laughs> Until next year for season 14 <laughs> in January. Keep screaming.